In this video, we'll cover Chapter R, Measurements and Calculations in Chemistry. Most of this material is review over your previous high school or introductory chemistry course. Most of the learning outcomes for this chapter deal with calculations, measurements, quantities, and again, this is meant to just introduce a lot of the basic uh, calculations and concepts that you'll need to know as you continue in the course. Besides calculations and measurements, we'll also look at some fundamental concepts important in chemistry, such as distinguishing between substances and mixtures, how to identify physical and chemical properties and changes, um, what are the properties of energy, and how we do some basic uh, calculations with energy. We'll start the discussion with measurements. A measurement is comparing a physical quantity to a standard. Take, for example, the measurement of mass on a top-loading balance. The actual quantity that is being measured is an electrical signal that's produced by a force or a pressure exerted when you place a load on the top of the balance. That electrical signal is compared to a standard. The standard would be standard masses of known um, calibrated quantity, for example, a one kilogram or a 500 kilogram mass. And the balance is calibrated with these standard masses so that the actual physical quantity being measured, the electrical signal, can be converted into a mass in grams or kilograms. When I record a measurement, it always needs to contain two parts, and those two parts are a number and a scale. Um, another term for scale is units. And so in chemistry, we always emphasize that when you report an answer, you always need to report that answer with units. And an example I like to provide to students to explain how important units are is if I were to say I am 70, students in the classroom would look at me and say, no, you're not 70. And I would tell them, yes, I'm 70. Well, 70 has no meaning unless I provide units. They were assuming the units were years old, but actually they were kilograms. So when I say I am 70, I am being truthful, I am 70 kilograms. So again, you need to have your number and your units in order for your measurement to be meaningful. There are two measurement systems that are used. There's English and metric, and that can lead to some confusion. So in the United States, in our commerce, um, at the grocery store, uh, the English system is used. So we're talking pounds, feet, inches, etc. But in science, we use the metric system. So instead of pounds or ounces, we would use grams or kilograms for mass. When we're measuring distances or lengths, we would use meters rather than feet, inches, and yards or miles. Um, and so the metric system is very versatile because you'll have a base unit and then you'll have a prefix that can make that base unit larger or smaller. In 1960, an international group of scientists set up a uniform set of units called the SI system. SI stands for Système International. And these are the standard units for uh, all of the basic physical quantities that you would measure. For example, if you're measuring mass, the SI unit for mass is the kilogram. Uh, length, the SI unit is meter. Time, the SI unit is second, and so on and so forth. These are the basic units. We will then look at some combined units. For example, density is mass divided by volume. And so the SI unit for density would be kilograms divided by meters cubed. Meters cubed would be the combined unit for volume. Now, depending on the quantity measure, we may or may not actually want to use the SI unit. It may not be the right size. It could be too large or small. And so, like I mentioned before, the metric system is very convenient because we can use a prefix to make a unit smaller or larger. And there are several prefixes that will make your metric units smaller or larger, as you can see here. The ones that you need to be familiar with are going from 10 to the negative 12, okay? 
um, and that would be pico all the way up to 10 to the positive 12, which is tera. So you do need to be familiar with all of the units between pico and tera. In order to work with exponents, we need to be familiar with how to manipulate them. An exponent tells you how many decimal places there are before or after an integer. So a positive exponent, that refers to a number that is greater than one. So when you see a positive exponent, you have a large number. Conversely, a negative exponent is a value that is small and is less than one. When you are working with two exponential numbers and you need to multiply them together, what do you do with the exponents? You add them. When you're dividing exponential numbers, you will subtract the exponents. Let's look at a few examples. Okay, in the first one, we're multiplying two exponential numbers. So in order to figure out the exponent for the answer, we're simply going to add the exponents together. So 3 plus 5 is 8, and therefore 10 to the 3 times 10 to the 5 equals 10 to the 8th power. What about the next one? 10 to the 6th times 10 to the negative 8. Again, I'll add those exponents together. Bear in mind if one of them is negative, that's going to impact your answer. 6 plus a negative 8 is negative 2, therefore the answer is 10 to the negative 2. The next one is a division, so I'm dividing exponential numbers. I will now subtract the exponents, and 5 minus 2 is 3, and so the answer to 10 to the 5 divided by 10 to the 2 is 10, divide, 10 to the third power. And finally, 10 to the 12 divided by 10 to the negative 3. To figure out my exponent, I'm going to subtract the exponents. And 12 minus a negative 3 is actually 12 plus 3, or 15. And therefore, the answer is 10 to the 15. You need to be familiar with the base units for length, volume, and mass. And those are meters, liters, and grams. And then we need to have a feel for the approximate size of each of these values. A meter is pretty easy to remember. It's roughly the same size as one yard, and we all know what a yardstick looks like. And then what is a liter? A liter is approximately one quart, and we're pretty familiar with the two liter bottles of soda, so half of that would be one liter. Gram is a little bit harder to visualize since we are not using the metric system in our everyday lives. And so for me, the easiest thing to remember is that a nickel weighs five grams. So one gram is about one fifth the size of a nickel. Uh, you can also remember that there are about 28 grams in one ounce and 2.2 pounds in one kilogram. Some other uh, common items that we can use to remember the magnitude of these values. Uh, a dime is about one millimeter thick. So if you're wondering about how big one millimeter is, it's the thickness of a dime. A quarter, on average, has a diameter of two and a half centimeters, which is roughly one inch as well. Um, an adult man is about 1.8 meters tall. Um, as I said earlier, the nickel has a mass of five grams, and a 12 ounce can of soda is about 360 milliliters. One of the first OWL homework problems you'll have is converting between metric units. For these first few examples, um, you are asked to tell how many of the base unit are in a metric unit with a prefix. So for these, you just need to know the definition of the prefix. P stands for pico, and pico means 10 to the negative 12. So therefore, one picometer equals 10 to the negative 12 meters. In the next one, how many grams are in one gigagram? So giga is 10 to the positive 9. And so therefore, one gigagram contains 10 to the positive 9 grams. In this problem, we're asked to convert the grams to milligrams. And so we recognize that one milligram equals 10 to the negative 3 grams. Okay, and we 
we're, are going to put the milligrams on the top because that's what we're trying to calculate. And we're going to put the grams on the bottom so that they can cancel out with the given grams. At that point, the quantities on the top and the bottom of the conversion ratio are equivalents. Our grams cancel out. We're left with milligrams. So now we can calculate the answer. And in the calculator, we'll put in 2.09 divided by 1 times 10 to the negative 3. And for the answer, we will get 2,090 milligrams. Just to recap how you want to enter this into the calculator, if you have 2.09 divided by 1 times 10 to the negative 3, what you'll type in is 2.01 divided by 1. Then you're going to use the second function, ee, which means times 10 to the power of. Then you're going to use the negative sign and 3. Finally, you'll hit Enter, and that will give you your answer of 2,090 milligrams.
Now we're going to talk about uncertainty in measurement. So when chemists make a measurement, they will report their values to a certain number of significant figures. And this provides an estimate of the uncertainty in the value that they're reporting. Note that the last digit in a measurement is the one that's estimated. Uh, all other digits are certain, but the last one, which is the one that has the uncertainty in it. For example, if you're reading volume from a burette, each of the lines is 0.1 milliliters, so you will then estimate to the 0.01 mils. And that estimation of the last decimal place is the one digit that is uncertain. So when we're reading the burette volume, we're going to read the tenths place and then we're going to estimate the hundredths place and that's how we will report the value to the nearest 0.01 of a milliliter. When you're looking at a burette, please note that you do need to look at it straight on. Don't look at it from above or from below. When you do that, you introduce error into your measurement called parallax. When you're reading burette volumes, you do want to note that the graduations are typically 0.1 milliliters, which means you will estimate one decimal place beyond that, you will estimate to the 0.01 milliliters. In the burette on the left, the meniscus is in between 30.1 and 30.2. It's a little bit closer to 30.1, so I would estimate it at about 30.14 or 30.13 milliliters. On the next one, we have the bottom of the meniscus actually sitting almost dab smack on the 30.6 mil line. So I would call that one 30.60 milliliters. Okay, so on the left we have a burette and on the right we have a graduated cylinder. We need to record the volume on each and decide which device has more certainty. Let's start with the graduated cylinder. What is the volume of liquid that the graduated cylinder contains? Well, we see that the meniscus uh, is sitting, let's see, almost directly on the 21, 22, 23 mil line. And so we would estimate it at about 23.0 since it seems to be sitting right on the 23 line. For the burette, we have a meniscus that is just below the 20 line, but before the 20.1. So we can estimate it at 20.01 or 20.02 milliliters. We can see that because the burette is giving two decimal places, um, it will have more certainty than the graduated cylinder. Speaking of uncertainty, we have two different measurements that impact uncertainty. There is precision, which can be thought of as the repeatability of a measurement. And then there is accuracy, which can be thought of as the closeness of the measurement to the true value. And so in the previous example, which device would you say yields more repeatable measurements? Definitely the burette. Repeatability is referred to as precision. And then we have the closeness of the measurement to the standard recorded value. So that's called calibration certainty and that is what is known as accuracy. So a lot of people will use the terms accuracy and precision interchangeably, but as you can see here, they mean two different things. Let's look at a visual example illustrating accuracy and precision. So if we want to know which of these bullseyes are accurate, we're looking for one where the average falls right in the center. So the upper right is definitely accurate. Also, all the data points are close to one another. So in addition to being accurate, we would say this one is also precise. So that's an ideal world when you have both accuracy and precision. Let's look at the top left. We still have very good precision. The data points are still close to each other, but it is not accurate. It is just simply precise. Let's look at the bottom left. So now we have a problem because 
all of the dots, where, does, where is their average? It's somewhere out here, which means that we are not accurate and we are not precise. So the bottom left is worst case scenario. You're not accurate and you're not precise. What about the bottom right? At first glance, it seems to also have a lot of problems, but actually, if you were to average all these data points together, you would have an accurate result. It would just not be precise. When you're trying to decide how many significant digits or figures an answer should have, you can use these rules of thumb. Number one, all non-zero digits are significant. So anything that's not a zero is automatically a significant digit. Zeros may or may not be significant. If they're leading zeros, they're not. If they're trailing zeros, they might be, depending on whether they're after a decimal place or not. And if they are trapped zeros, then they will always be significant. Okay, and then we have exact numbers. Things like there are 12 inches and one foot or three feet and one yard. Those numbers three and 12 are what we call exact numbers. By definition, a foot is 12 inches. And since these numbers are exact numbers, they have an infinite number of significant digits and they will not affect the number of sig figs in your reported answer. All right, let's look at a few numbers and identify how many significant figures are in each of these values. So leading zeros are not significant. Therefore, we only have three significant figures. Next one, we have three non-zero digits. So for sure there are three, I'm sorry, four non-zero digits, so for sure there are four sig figs, but do those trailing zeros count as significant figures? Well, they are after a decimal place, therefore they do count. So for this example, we have a total number of six significant digits. What about the next one? <coughs> well, the zeros are between non-zero digits, so they're automatically significant, so all of the reported digits are significant and that value has five significant figures. And lastly, 78,000, the trailing zeros are not after a decimal place. They're automatically not significant. And therefore the number of sig figs in this last example is two. And here we have the format for scientific notation. You would start with the prefix a and then you would have it times 10 to a certain power. a is always a value between 1 and 10. You can't have one that's above 10, you can't have one that's less than 1. And every digit included in a is significant. The exponents don't count as significant figures at all. OWL R.4 is going to have us convert numbers into scientific notation, and it asks us to report each one to three significant figures. Starting with the first example, we have to decide what our A value is, and given that it needs to be a number between one and 10, it's gonna be 3.47. Now we need to figure out, once we make that 3.47, what does our exponent need to be? I'm gonna count the number of places between where the decimal place is now and where it was originally. One, two, three, four. 
Okay, so we had to move the decimal place over four to the left to make it the original number. Therefore, it's 3.47 times 10 to the negative four. You can also write that as 3.47 e negative four. One thing to note as, is that when you have a 10 to the negative four number, notice that you will have three zeros before your non-zero digit. If you had, let's say, 10 to the negative two, then you would have one zero. That's how the negative exponents work. Let's try the next example. This one is greater than one, so I'm gonna have a positive exponent. First, I need to convert this into a number between one and 10, and it's gonna be 8.55. Next, I need to figure out what the exponent is. And in this case, I have to move to the right one, two, three, to go where the decimal place was originally. Therefore, it would be 8.55 times 10 to the three can also be expressed as 8.55 e positive three. And the next one, we will follow a similar pattern. We need a number between one and 10, and that will be 4.49. And then to figure out the exponent, we're gonna count the number of places between where we put the, exp the decimal point and where it was. So one, two, three, four, five. Given it's a large number, it will have a positive exponent. And the answer is 4.49 times 10 to the five or 4.49 E5. And in the last example, we have a small number less than one. We're gonna have a negative exponent and it will be 8.89. This time I'm just gonna count my zeros after the decimal place. There are three zeros, therefore it's 10 to the negative four. So 8.89 times 10 to the negative four. Next, we need to figure out how to handle significant digits with calculations. Depends on the operation. Multiplication and division, we're gonna give the answer the same number of significant figures as the measurement that had the fewest sig figs. But for addition and subtraction, Instead of total sig figs, we're gonna look at decimal places. Your answer will have the same number of decimal places as the measurement with the fewest decimal places. Now, you will either need to keep the last digit um, the same or round it up depending on what is after that digit. So, if what is after the last digit is greater than five, you're gonna round up. If it's less than five, you will keep the digit the same. Let's look at an example. How many hours are there in exactly 14 days? One thing to note about sig figs is when you have an exact number, it would have an infinite number of sig figs. All right, so we'll start with the given quantity of 14 days, and then we're gonna use dimensional analysis to convert that from days to hours. Well, how many hours are there in one day? There are 24 hours in one day. We'll put the one day at the bottom so that days can cancel out. And we'll put the 24 hours in the top so that we are calculating hours. To determine the answer, we will need to take 14 times 24. And that gives us 336 hours. Now the question is, do I report all three of those significant digits? At first glance, when you see 14 and 24, you might think each of those numbers has two significant figures and therefore your answer would round to two sig figs. However, both of the numbers going into this calculation are exact numbers. The conversion between hours and days is an exact number and what we were given exactly 14 days also is an exact number and will have an infinite number of sig figs. Therefore, report all of the digits in your answer and know that your answer has an infinite number of sig figs. In this next set of problems, we'll be carrying out a mathematical operation and then we will be determining how to report the answer to the correct number of sig figs. In the first example, we have 13.97 plus 41.29. Since this is addition, we are going to limit our answer to 
the fewest number of decimal places in the measurements given. Each of those measurements has two decimal places, therefore our answer will also have two decimal places. When we plug that into the calculator, we will get 55.26, uh, and that will remain as 55.26 with both decimal places reported. Let's look at the next example. This one, 87.30 divided by 76.6, given that it's division, we're now going to be looking at total number of significant figures. Let's look at how many each value has. The first one has four significant figures. Second one, three significant figures. Therefore, how many sig figs in our answer? It'll be three sig figs. Now we'll carry out the mathematical operation and we will round the answer to three sig figs, in which case we get 1.14. For more help with significant figures, watch the video linked here. You may have noticed at this point that the problems that we solve in chemistry are approached with a very systematic process. And here is a summary of that process. The first thing that you want to ask is, where am I going? What is my goal? What am I trying to calculate? Next, you would ask, what do I know? Where am I starting? So we have just established beginning and end. And what is left is in the middle. How do I get there? So you would figure out what type of calculation you need to do in order to get from the beginning to the end. And do not forget this fourth step, does my result make sense? After you have calculated your result, you need to look at that number and determine, okay, does that number make sense? Does it come close to what I expected? Which means at the very beginning, you really should have a hypothesis as to what your expected value is going to look like. A process that we have already been using that is often used to solve many chemistry problems is dimensional analysis. Dimensional analysis is a calculation method that uses an initial value multiplied by a conversion factor so that the units appearing on the top and bottom cancel out and you're left with the units that are desired in your answer. And here's a very simple example, but it's using the dimensional analysis approach. We are given 24 inches and we are asked to calculate how many feet that represents. So we would start the calculation with that given value of 24 inches. Then we would have a conversion factor. So we're given inches, we want to calculate feet. So we need a conversion between inches and feet. And we all know there are 12 inches and one foot, that those are equal quantities. We put the 12 inches on the bottom because that allows inches to cancel out and it leaves foot or feet on the top, so we are calculating feet. Finally, when you plug this into the calculator, all the numbers on the top get multiplied, all the numbers on the bottom get divided, so it's 24 times one divided by 12, and I get two with the unit being feet, so the answer is two feet. That approach is called dimensional analysis. Let's use that approach to solve a problem. Okay, so we are told that a quarter is found to have a volume of 0 0.00108 liters. By the way, how many significant figures are in that number? Leading zeros are not significant. The only ones here that are significant are one, zero, and eight. So we do have three significant figures. That'll be important when we're reporting our answer. So we have the volume and we want to know what that volume is in quarts. So we're converting from liters to quarts. In order to do that, we need a conversion factor. Let's look over here and see if we have a conversion factor. Yes, we do. One liter equals 1.06 quarts. So we'll start with our given quantity, 0 0.00108 liters. We'll multiply by the conversion factor, setting it up so that the liters can cancel out and we'll be left with quarts. 
And finally, we'll plug it into the calculator. We'll multiply all the numbers on the top, 0 0.00108 times 1.06, and then we'll divide the numbers on the bottom. Dividing by one doesn't change the result. We get this for our answer, and we know it needs to have three significant figures. And yes, we do have three significant figures in our answer. Does the answer make sense? Yes, it does, because a quart and a liter are almost equal quantities. There's 1.06 quarts and one liter. So I'm expecting a very similar number to what I started with. It'll be slightly higher, and that is what I got. I started with 0 0.108, and I ended with 0 0.114, a little bit higher number. So yes, the answer does make sense. Let's try one that's a bit more complicated but I think this one is very fun. We're given the radius of a uranium atom being 149 picometers. Pico, if you remember, is 10 to the negative 12. It's a very tiny size of an atom. How many uranium atoms would have to be laid side by side to span a distance of 1.92 millimeters? So milli is 10 to the negative three. I'm really going to have to do two processes, um, maybe three. The first process is I'm given radius. And as you know, radius is half of the diameter of the atom. So that is your radius, whereas your diameter would be the entire width. So the first thing I will need to do is to calculate the diameter by doubling the radius. If the radius is 149, if I double that, I get 298 picometers for the diameter. Next, I want to know how many of those 298 picometer atoms would it take to span an entire width of 1.92 millimeters. We kind of have an apples and oranges comparison because the total width is in millimeters, but the width of the atom is in picometers. So we are going to go through a process of converting the width of the atom from picometers to millimeters. And we are going to do that first by converting picometers to meters using the definition of pico as 10 to the negative 12. There are 10 to the negative 12 meters and one picometer. Now that we have meters, we can convert that to millimeters by using the definition of a millimeter, which is 10 to the negative three meters. Sometimes students will get confused about where to put the exponent. And a little tool that will help you remember how to set that up is B1 with the prefix. So here I have a prefix and I just have the one with the prefix. Same thing here, B1 with the prefix. That means your exponent is gonna go with the base unit and then set each of those terms up so that the proper units cancel out and you're left with the desired units that you want to calculate. Plugging that into the calculator, I would have 298 times one times 10 to the negative 12 divided by one times 10 to the negative three. And what I get is 2.98 times 10 to the negative seven millimeters. Does that number make sense? Well, my unit got larger. Milli is larger than pico. If the unit got larger, what should the number do? It should get smaller in order to be equivalent. So did my number get smaller? Yes, it did. It went from 298 to 2.98 times 10 to the negative 7. So since the unit got larger, the number got smaller, so that does make sense. Now that I have the width of the atom and I have the total distance that I want to span, I'm going to convert the width of the atom to the number of atoms that it would take to fill that space. So one atom occupies this space, and I want to know how many atoms would occupy 1.92 millimeters. I set it up like this so that the millimeters would cancel out, and now I'm calculating the number of atoms which is what we are asked to calculate. And from that, I get a whole lot of atoms. Does a large number make sense? Yes, it does, because atoms are tiny. 
and to span a width of 1.92 millimeters, it will take a lot of atoms. And so that number does make sense. At this point, you might be asking yourself, why are chemists making such a big deal about units and how to convert from one unit to another? Well, it can actually end up costing a lot of money. Back in 1999, NASA lost a $125 million Mars Climate Orbiter because of a simple failure to convert from English to metric units. You had two teams working on manipulating the lander uh, to measure the weather and climate patterns on Mars. There was a lab, the Jet Propulsion Lab in California, that assumed that the units were metric where the Denver lab of NASA was using English units. And so when they were working together, one team using metric, the other using English, obviously the landing velocity was not calculated correctly. Uh, they landed at the wrong velocity and therefore crashed the spacecraft and destroyed it. So um, this is a brilliant example of just how important it is to be very, very good when it comes to recognizing and using and converting between units. The next measurement that we need to be familiar with is temperature. Um, what exactly is temperature? Well, it's a measure of how hot or cold an object is, right? Uh, and, but we have different ways of measuring temperature. We have Fahrenheit, which we all use every day with weather and with body temperature. In science, we use Celsius or centigrade. Uh, and that is in the metric system. And then finally, we also oftentimes in science use absolute temperature, which is called Kelvin. And so because these three different uh, ways of measuring temperature are out there, we are going to need to, first of all, know our landmarks, and second of all, know how to convert between all three of them. So what are the landmarks? Well, water being such a ubiquitous substance, we need to know where water freezes and where water boils. In Celsius, water freezes at zero degrees Celsius. In Fahrenheit, it's 32 degrees Fahrenheit. What about room temperature? Room temperature is about 72 degrees Fahrenheit. In Celsius, that would be about 22 degrees. So if you're looking at weather, and maybe you're in Canada or in Europe, um, and they're reporting their weather in Celsius, they might say, oh, it's a beautiful day. It's 22 degrees outside. And you might be thinking, that's really cold. It's not, because in Celsius, 22 degrees Celsius is roughly the same as 72 degrees Fahrenheit. The next landmark to know is the boiling point of water, 100 degrees Celsius, 212 degrees Fahrenheit. At this point, you might be wondering, is it a coincidence that water freezes at zero degrees Celsius and boils at 100 degrees Celsius? No, it's not a coincidence. The Celsius system was built around water because it is such a common material. How do we convert from one unit of temperature to another? We'll start with Kelvin and Celsius. Degrees Kelvin is simply Celsius plus 273.15. Um, if you go down to negative 273 degrees Celsius, that would be the lowest possible Kelvin temperature, which is zero Kelvin. That's why we call Kelvin absolute temperature because it is not possible to go below zero Kelvin. Converting between Celsius and Fahrenheit is a little more complicated. So if I wanna calculate Celsius, I would take the Fahrenheit temperature, subtract 32, get my answer, because as you can see with parentheses, you need to do that operation first. Once you subtract the 32, you're gonna take that number and multiply it by five and divide by nine. In this problem, you're asked to determine whether one temperature in Fahrenheit is higher than another temperature in Celsius. In order to determine that, you need to convert the Fahrenheit temperature to Celsius. So we'll use the formula. We'll plug in the 119, subtract 32, multiply it by 5 ninths, and we get 48.3 degrees Celsius. At that point, we now can compare the two temperatures and we see that 48.3 Celsius is higher than 46.8. Therefore, 119 degrees Fahrenheit is higher than 46.9 degrees Celsius. For more help with converting between temperatures, check out the video linked here. 
Next, we're going to look at some derived units. These are combinations of two or more basic units. And here are some examples. So for area, since the SI unit for length is meter, then for area, it would be meters times meters, which would be meters squared. Volume then would be meters multiplied by itself three times, and that would be meters cubed, all right? Uh, what about the SI unit for density? Well, we know the SI unit for mass is kilogram, and we've just determined that the SI unit for volume is meters cubed, so the SI unit for density is kilograms per meter cubed. We don't always use the SI unit more commonly um, because in chemistry sometimes the scale is different than the SI unit, and I'll tell you for density we typically use grams per cubic centimeter for liquid and solid densities. All right, speed, distance per unit time. So again, distance or length, the SI unit is meter. And what was the SI unit for time? It was the second. So meters per second then is the SI unit for speed or velocity. And finally, acceleration is change in speed per unit time. And so it would be meters per second per second. In other words, meters per second squared. So those are just some examples of derived units and how you would determine their SI units would be take the SI units of the fundamental units and combine them together. We're going to look more closely at the derived unit density because this is a physical property of substances and it's useful in identifying various substances in chemistry. Density, as we said earlier, is mass per unit volume. We typically measure it in grams per cubic centimeter, and that is the same as grams per milliliter. So a cubic centimeter and a milliliter are the same thing. For gases, because they're so much less dense, those tend to be expressed as grams per liter. In this problem, we are gonna use density to try to identify an unknown metal. And we'll start by running the formula for density. Density equals mass over volume. We're gonna look in the problem and determine uh, what information is given in order to solve the problem. So we do have the mass at 297.5 grams. And for volume, we're actually given a volume of water at 15.2 milliliters. So let's read a little bit closer to figure out what that represents. So the student dropped the metal into a measuring cup and found that it just dis displaced 15.2 mils of water. So the volume of water displaced is equal to the volume of the metal. We have both pieces of information. We can now just plug those into the formula. Density is equal to 297.5 divided by, and don't forget to include your units, grams divided by 15.2 milliliters. When we plug that into the calculator, we get 1.5 19.6 grams per milliliter. Okay, now we're gonna look at our table and compare that to the values that were given. And 19.6 is closest to actually a couple of them, but closer to tungsten. So tentatively, uh, we would say that the metal is tungsten. You can also use physical properties like the color of the metal. Gold and tungsten are gonna have different colors. Since that information is not given, our best guess would be tungsten, which has a symbol of W. For more help with density problems, check out the video that is linked here. In this next section, we are going to talk about chemistry. As you might already know, chemistry is the study of matter and the changes that it undergoes. What is matter? Matter is anything that has mass and occupies space. And there are three common states of matter, which include solids, liquids, and gases. 
How do they differ from one another? Well, as you might know, a solid has definite shape and definite volume. While a liquid does have definite volume, it has indefinite shape. A liquid will take the shape of the container that it's in. Gases, on the other hand, have both indefinite shape and definite volume. You can compress and expand a gas depending on the pressure applied. The fourth state of matter is a plasma, and a plasma is an ionized gas. Things like neon lights or lightning, all of those are considered to be plasmas. In this OWL problem, you're shown some particle diagrams and you're asked to figure out the state of matter based on the diagram. So solids, definite shape, definite volume. The particles are not moving much other than vibrating. So the center example definitely is a solid. The example on the left would be a liquid because we're not expanding into the entire container. We're sitting at the bottom of the container, but you see a more random positioning of the particles because they are moving around, sliding around one another. The diagram on the right would be a gas because now it's expanding to fill the container that it's in. So matter can be classified by its physical properties and also by chemical properties. What is the difference? A physical property is one that can be observed without changing the substance's identity. Things like the color, the odor, the state, the temperature at which a substance melts, that is, goes from solid to liquid, or the temperature at which that substance boils goes from liquid to gas, how hard or soft the object is, the shape of the object, or how it dissolves in a particular solvent. All of those are physical properties because they're not changing the substance's identity. When measuring a chemical property, now you're describing the way that the substance undergoes a chemical change to form a new substance. Examples include the reactivity toward oxygen or water. So if you take a reactive metal, combine it with oxygen, that metal will turn into a metal oxide. Or the flammability. So when you try to ignite the sample, does it catch on fire and burn? Through the burning process, it will change its identity. And finally, decomposition, as the name implies, you have one substances and it's decomposing, breaking down into two or more other substances. Physical properties don't change the substance's identity and chemical properties do change the substance's identity. Here's a summary of physical and chemical properties and changes. You can pause the video and take a minute to look at these various changes to ensure that you understand what types of things would be classified as physical and what types of things would be classified as chemical. And then there are different types of matter. There are pure substances, which is a single kind of matter that can't be separated by physical means. Uh, this can either be a single element or a compound. Both of those are considered pure substances. And here are some examples, calcium with the symbol CA, water, H2O, or aluminum, AL, all of those are pure substances. Now let's distinguish elements from compounds. An element is a pure substance that can't be broken down by chemical means. Gold, silver, copper, all of those are elements. Periodic table has all of the known elements on it. A compound, on the other hand, is a pure substance that can be broken down into simpler substances if you do a chemical reaction. You can't separate a compound by physical means, that's why it's a pure substance, but you can separate a compound by chemical means, and therefore it's a compound and not an element. Examples are water, H2O, carbon dioxide, CO2, salt, NaCl. And you can see that each of those contains more than one type of element. A mixture different from a pure substance is a physical combination of two or more pure substances in which each substance retains its own chemical identity. We have two types of mixtures. We have the heterogeneous mixture where the substances that are combined are not uniform. You can see different phases. And then examples of those would be soil or salad dressing where you have your oil and water kind of being separate. A homogeneous mixture is one that is uniform. A solution, by definition, is a homogeneous mixture. Examples include air. That is a homogeneous mixture of gases. 
salt water, that's a homogeneous mixture of liquids. And then 14 karat gold is a homogeneous mixture of solids. It has gold, silver, and a little bit of copper. These are the types of matter. You can pause the video to take a closer look at each of these. Let's look at some examples. Classify each of the following as either a pure substance, element, or compound, or a homogeneous or heterogeneous mixture. Let's start with aluminum foil. So aluminum, Al, that is an element, and it is a pure substance. Isopropyl alcohol. This is a compound, and it contains carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen chemically combined into one substance. It could be broken down by chemical reactions, but not by any kind of physical process. Air is a homogeneous mixture of various gases, nitrogen, oxygen, argon, carbon dioxide, and water vapor. Chocolate chip ice cream we know is definitely a mixture of lots of different things, and because it's not uniform, it is a heterogeneous mixture. Maple syrup contains sugar and other flavoring uh, agents all dissolved in water, so it is a mixture and typically it would look pretty uniform, therefore be homogeneous. Finally, an iron nail, if it's pure iron, would be a pure substance element. Fe is the symbol for iron. For more help with classifying samples of matter, check out the video that's linked here. Another way that matter can be described is according to its size. So items that we can feel and touch and see with our eyes are referred to as macroscopic. Items that need to be viewed under a microscope are microscopic. And then items that are even smaller than what you could see under a microscope are considered particulate. So molecules and atoms are particulate. Um, individual cells or single-celled organisms are microscopic or uh, just really tiny things that you can look at um, under a microscope but not see with your naked eye are all microscopic and then everyday objects you can feel touch and see uh, without any device are macroscopic let's start with the uranium atom well since it's an atom it's going to be particulate beach sand that's something we can see without any devices so it is macroscopic an amoeba that is a small cellular organism and so that would be microscopic and finally the water molecule also like an atom is going to be particulate with particulate level samples we can look at illustrations and determine if they represent an element compound or even a mixture so starting with the first sample, it looks like we have two different types of atoms, a large blue atom and three small white atoms all bonded together and all of the units in that sample are the same. So that first one would be a compound. The second one, we have green spheres uh, that are all identical and they're in pairs or groupings of two. And so since all of the um, atoms are the same, that would definitely be an element. It's a diatomic element. And then the last one, we have all blue spheres. That's monoatomic, and it's all the same element. Let's look at some examples. Let's classify each of these changes as either physical or chemical. In the first one, burning charcoal in a gas grill, uh, essentially with this one you are doing a combustion reaction whenever you burn a sample that's a chemical reaction and therefore a chemical change whipping cream when you're whipping cream you're sort of stirring it really fast and introducing air into the cream which kind of makes it fluffy and so in that case uh, that is just a physical change souring of milk on the other hand does involve a chemical change you can tell because the sample begins to smell differently. Uh, you see lumps appearing, uh, sometimes even bubbles forming. And so those are all signs of a chemical change. And finally, boiling water. When you're boiling any substance, you are changing it from a liquid to a gas. That's just a change in the state of matter and therefore a physical change. 
For more help with physical and chemical changes, check out the video that is linked here. Once you have determined that you have a mixture, uh, there's various ways that you can separate the different components of the mixture. Um, one way is filtration. This is when you have a solid and a liquid combined together. You can filter out the solid and separate it from the liquid. Another method is evaporation. So if you have um, a solid dissolved into a liquid, you can heat up that mixture and evaporate the liquid, and what you have left behind is the solid. Another way of separating a mixture is distillation. This is a way of separating liquids that are dissolved in one another and have different boiling points. So through distillation, you can separate the different liquids in the mixture by their boiling points. Chromatography, this is a process where compounds are infused into a stationary phase by way of a moving or mobile phase. So your stationary phase might be a silica gel packed into a column. Your mobile phase might be a solvent that is forced to move through that column. Once you introduce your sample mixture, the different components in the mixture are gonna have different attractions to the stationary and mobile phases, and therefore those different components of the mixture will move at different speeds down the chromatography column. And through that process of moving at different speeds, you end up separating the components of a mixture. Chromatography is a whole collection of different techniques. We have gas chromatography, paper chromatography, liquid chromatography, column chromatography, just to name a few. And uh, they all use a stationary and mobile phase, and they involve different components of the mixture moving at different rates down that system. Electrophoresis, um, similar to chromatography, but instead of separating with a stationary and mobile phase, you now are separating charged substances by putting them into an electric field and those different charged substances moving at different speeds through the system. Magnetic separation, as the name implies, you're just going to use a magnet to remove any iron and steel from other solids. All right, let's look at some pictures and see if we can figure out what type of separation methods are being used. So in this first picture, we see an evaporating dish, we see a mixture of salt and water, and we see a Bunsen burner heating that mixture, water evaporating. We're left with salt at the bottom. That's definitely evaporation. In the next one, we see an electric field. There's a negative charge at the top and a positive charge at the bottom. When we see the components of the mixture being separated into different bands, that is electrophoresis because of the electric field. In this next diagram, we have a flask that's being heated. Vapors are generated. They come up and then travel into the condenser region where the cool water running in a jacket is going to cause the vapors to condense back to liquid. Gravity is going to pull them down, and the different liquids with different boiling points will come out at different times and therefore be separated. That is distillation. All right, the next one we see a filter funnel with filter paper. We're pouring a mixture of solid and liquid into that filter, and the solids are stopping. Liquids are coming through. That is filtration. In the next one, we see a piece of paper submersed in a liquid, and we see different colors kind of moving up the paper. That is paper chromatography. The next one, we see the person holding a magnet and the metallic bits sticking to the magnet, the rest of the solid staying behind. That's magnetic separation. And finally, we see a column that has a stationary phase and a mobile phase, which is solvent moving through. And we see different bands being separated and coming out at different times. That's another version of chromatography. Now, let's look at some different scenarios and see if we can figure out the best way to separate these mixtures. What if you had a mixture of sand, water, and acetone? How could you separate that mixture? Well, the sand could be separated by filtration. The water and acetone could then be separated by distillation. What if you're given a solution of three different amino acids dissolved in water? How could you separate that mixture? Now that we have three different solutes, a good way to do it would be chromatography 
or maybe even electrophoresis. What if you need to remove staples and paper clips from a recycled paper pulp? Because the staples and paper clips are typically made of steel or iron, uh, they could be separated by a magnetic separation. Next, we need to talk about energy. So in chemical reactions, we could have energy being produced or we could have energy being required. And energy is defined as the capacity to move matter and do work. Energy comes in different forms, including chemical, electromagnetic, mechanical, electrical, and heat energy. And heat uh, energy can be interconverted between different types, but energy is always conserved. That is, we can't create or destroy energy. An example of an energy conversion is a power plant. So a coal-powered plant will start with burning the pulverized coal, and you're taking the potential energy in the chemical bonds of coal, and when you burn it, you're, uh, it's an exothermic reaction, so heat is produced, so that energy is changing from potential energy to heat energy. The heat is used to take liquid water and boil it, turn it into steam or vapor water, and at that point, the steam is going to cause the turbine to spin. So now we've taken the heat energy and converted it to kinetic energy. From there, when the turbine is spinning, uh, you're turning a magnet in a generator, and that produces electricity. And so you've now converted the kinetic energy into electrical energy. So through that process, we have not created or destroyed energy. It's just changed forms. For more help on the law of the conservation of energy, check out the video that's linked here. Potential energy is the energy of an object due to its position in a field such as gravitational, electric, or magnetic. Kinetic energy is the energy associated with an object by virtue of its motion. And we do have an equation for kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is equal to one half of mass times velocity squared. The SI unit of energy is the joule. The joule is a derived unit from three different fundamental units. It is equal to a kilogram times a meter squared per second squared. Now, we do have a non-SI unit that's often used in chemistry called the calorie. And uh, it is defined as the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. How does that relate to the joule? there are about 4.18 joules in one calorie. In this problem, you're asked to calculate the kinetic energy of an object that has a mass of 0 0.0150 kilograms and a velocity of 24 meters per second. So you take the kinetic energy equation, uh, kinetic energy equals one half of mass times velocity squared, plug in the mass, plug in the velocity, and the result is 4.32 kilograms meter squared per second squared, and that derived unit is a joule, 4.32 joules. For more help with kinetic energy problems, check out the video linked here. Another problem you might see is one where you need to convert energy in joules to energy in calories. Okay, so let's look at this problem. We have 18.02 grams of water that is being boiled and it requires 40.65 kilojoules of heat. And we just want to know how many calories of heat is that? So for this problem, we don't really need to use the 18.02 grams. We just need to use the 40.65 kilojoules. And then we need to use the conversion factor between joules and calories. Note that because this was kilojoules, we did multiply it by 1,000 to convert it to joules because there are 1,000 joules in one kilojoule. So 40,650 joules times one calorie over 4.184 joules. When we set it up like that, we can see that the joules cancel out and our answer will be in calories. For that, we get 9,716 calories being equal to 
40,650 joules. In this diagram, we're looking at hydroelectric generation of electricity. And this is at a dam where you have water at a high point and then gravity uh, causing the water to move to a low point. As the water moves through, it's going to spin the turbine and generate electrical energy. In summary, water falls through the dam, its velocity increases, and its potential energy is converted into a kinetic energy that is used to spin the turbine and generate the electricity. And this brings us to the first law of thermodynamics also known as the law of the conservation of energy. This law states that energy may be converted from one form to another, but the total quantity of energy remains constant. And this does conclude our first chapter, the review chapter. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me. Thank you.